calls. Um, although you might be able to watch the video without anybody actually there. You know, I can't teach it on the video. Um, so, and as I said, you know, please feel free to help yourself with other donuts. Um, this is mostly meant for those people who didn't show up because they don't have donuts. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so we are going to be doing, um, we continue basically yesterday's class. Um, where we talked about blind search strategies, and we talked about blind search strategies um, where all the edge costs were uniform and they were cost one. Okay, so what we'll start doing today is consider a more general, and also yesterday we talked about the tree search as well as graph search, and graph search with directed edges, graph search with undirected edges. We talked about all those things. Okay. So we're just basically starting from there and generalizing the model, generalizing the model um, such that we have uh, uh, non-uniform costs on the edges. Okay, so that means here, for example, in this graph, this edge is one. That means this action takes one cost. This action takes cost one, cost one, cost two, and this one takes cost nine. Now the interesting thing, of course, about these kinds of graphs is the shortest path is no longer connected to the shallowest gap, right? Because if you come from A to G, this way you have the shallowest depth. But that is a nine cost solution. So it, that's not a good solution. So when you want optimal solution, you still want to consider finding this before finding this. It almost looks as if depth first would have found this in this case, faster than the other one, right? So. So we're going to look at these non-uniform cost um, graphs and searching on them. And um, now, one interesting thing that you have to get used to is uh, the sort of the silliness of the nomenclature. Um, when you have non-uniform cost on the edges, they call it uniform cost search. Don't ask me why. Okay, it's one of I didn't name it that way, but you know they call it uniform cost search uh, when the edge costs are actually non-uniform. It's a very silly thing. Um, but given that, then, so the question then is, can we you know, deal with uh, generalizations of depth first strategy in particular, uh, which was already optimal before? Can you make it optimal here? And the idea is that instead of putting, so think, not, think of the depth first strategy uh, previously, where we were essentially putting the, the uh, it was a FIFO queue, that means first in, first out, right? But you can also think of it essentially as you are introducing, here is a queue, and the queue is sorted in terms of depth. Depth of the node, okay? So here is lower depth, and here is higher depth. Right? Okay. Now it turned out that since it's being sorted that way, since it turned out that since the depth first search anyway is essentially uh, going level by level, the ones that come, uh, you know, that get generated, always wind up having higher depth than everybody who's on the queue, and so they just go to the end of the queue. Okay. Now in this scenario, depth D of N is also the cost G of N. You know, you use the notation G to talk about the cost of going to that node from the root node. Okay? Uh, so in this case, DN happened to be GN. So now if you think of that breadth first search as if it's a prioritized queue, that means a queue where, you know, the nodes are introduced in terms of priorities, where the priority happens to be G of N, where G of N was defined as D of N. Okay, nothing changes. The algorithm remains the same, right? You just re-visualized uh, what the algorithm is doing. Now, I'll say now that, well, why don't we just, instead of D of N being, G, you know, basically, instead of uh, defining the G of N just as uh, the number of operators, define G of N as actually the cumulative cost of the operators, right? And then, so you then basically uh, sort the queue in terms of the G values of the nodes, such that the 
nodes with the lower G values come here, nodes with the higher G values go to the end. Right? Okay? That's what we want to do. Now, if you do that, in essence, of course, it's no longer first in, it's no longer adding things to the end of the queue or the beginning of the queue. You introduce the nodes into the queue based on the merit. Okay? That's basically what you wind up doing. Okay? Now, if you do that, it turns out, actually, let's see whether that works, and it turns out that, in fact, it has all these very great properties. It will be optimal, it will be admissible, and all that fun stuff. Okay? So let's actually look at that in this particular case. Um, if you start with A, and I'm going to show the search now. Okay, so I start with N0, which is A. Okay, and I write in brackets next to the node the G value of that node. Okay, since it's a root node, G value is zero. Okay, and then the open list only has A, uh, and so you, um, open list only has N0, so you expand it. When you expand it, you get N1, B, and uh, N2, G. Okay, now N1B basically has the G value, G value of the parent plus the action taken to get here. So G value of any node is G value of the parent node plus the cost of the action taken to come from the parent node to this node, simple enough. Okay, so here the G value is, um, is basically one and here the G value is nine. Now, in the open list, you need to put these guys in. You put them in the order of their um, the G values, okay? So currently, on the open list, A went away, and so B and G get in, and B will be obviously in the front, and G will be in the back, right? Okay? Um, and so now, I pick B from open list, because that's where it, you always pick from the front of the queue. Now, if you do that, you get M3C, because remember, this is a directed graph, so B only has one child C, and that is at you know, node 3C, and whose G value would be the G value of the parent plus one, two. Now, in the queue, right now, you had N2G, which is nine. Now, you need to put in N3C into the queue. Obviously, it should be put in the sorted order, so you will put N3C here. Right? You just prioritize Q. Now you again pick from the front of the queue. This time you pick C. Okay? If you pick C, you get D, and whose G value is 3. Now once again, D will be sitting in front of G. Okay? Now you pick D to expand. You get another G value, another node, M5, which also happens to be the same state, G. Remember, the same, the multiple nodes can correspond to the same state. So you get um, G again back into the queue, okay? Now this time, what happens is you now have the queue with N5G, which is five costly, and, N and N2G, N2G, which is nine costly. This is the interesting thing. So, in fact, it's best to think of the queue as the tip of a path rather than a state. Okay? So, essentially, I'm right now I have this path and this path vying for my attention. And I need to decide which path to expand. Okay? Clearly, I will expand this because it has lower G value, so I pick it. So, I'm about to expand this path and I ask myself, is the tip of this path already a goal? In this case, yes, so I stop. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so you did get, did you get the optimal solution in this example? Of course you did. Okay, now a question that you might ask yourself is, will we always get optimal solution? Well, the answer is yes, because the worry that you have is, I just found myself, let's say this particular approach found you a path to the goal, okay? And then you're wondering, is this optimal path or not? I mean, can I prove that it's optimal path? Um, let's just look at that on the book board. <coughs> so I'm trying, this is sort of a proof. It's actually a proof. So I'm starting from some N0 to NK 
goal. Okay, and I start with this. My algorithm start with this. My algorithm, which prioritizes the queue in terms of G values, start with this. I want to prove to myself that there can't be that this is optimal path to the goal. Okay. Now, for this to be optimal path to the goal, what I would worry is maybe there exists some other path, M J. Okay, I'm sorry, actually, some, some other path, and J, which is also going to go, and that's somehow better. Okay, that means G of NK is greater than G of NJ. Better basically means the G cost is lower. That's my worry, right? That's my worry. Now, then I would ask myself, well, at the time I picked NKG to expand from the open queue, either this guy must have been on the open queue along with this node, or some ancestor of this guy, let's say NL, some node, okay, which is on the open list. Do you view this? Do you understand what I'm saying? So either both goals happen to be, both paths to the goal happen to be on the open list at the same time, or uh, you haven't yet generated this, but some ancestor of it must have been on the open list. Right? Okay? So, now, if you picked, when NL was there and NK was there on the open list, if you picked NK over NL, that must have been because G of NK is less than or equal to G of ML. Otherwise, you wouldn't have picked NK, unless you know your program is messed up. Okay. Now, if G of NK is already less than or equal to G of ML, can when you expand this path, can the cost of the path reduce? No. Right. So, since the cost of the path cannot reduce, G of NJ now cannot be less than G of NK. Did, did you see the, so I just proved by contradiction that you don't need to worry about this happening to you. There was one property I used in doing this. I essentially said, if the path here is already less than, costlier than or equally as costly as the complete path, okay, then when you expand it, it can't become cheaper. When you expand it, it cannot become cheaper. For costs to not get cheaper, what must be true on the action costs? Negative edges. They can, what? Negative edges. Yeah, so edges cannot be negative. If doing actions, um, doing actions reduces cost, then this won't be true. So as long as you assume that all actions are positive cost, can be epsilon, but positive cost. Okay? Then you're guaranteed that when this search ends and gives you a solution, it will be optimal. Okay? The only worry, of course, is will this search ever end? If it ends, then it'll give you an optimal solution. Will it ever end? And for that, the requirement is that every action is it's not just enough to be, so in fact, for the optimality to hold, you only want the actions to be zero or positive cost. Zero or positive cost, because even if everything else from here to here is zero cost, since this is already equal, at worst you would have had one more goal path which is as good as the one you got, and there's no difference. Okay, so what you really, so for optimality, action cost can be zero. But for completeness, action cost cannot be zero. Okay, so we'll see examples of that, but essentially for completeness, all you want is action should be, at the cost of every action should be greater than or equal to epsilon, where epsilon itself is greater than or equal to zero. So the, all of them are positive non-zero cost. And if you have positive non-zero cost, you are guaranteed both completeness and optimal. 
Okay, so that's basically the the point. Okay, um, so now continuing. So that's a proof. Actually, I'll show you a slide which writes that proof down, but I just did it in front of you. Okay, so continuing. In this case, things were okay, um, but sometimes you can have bad graphs. Here is a a, a graph. So completeness is preserved as long as you have action costs are positive. Optimality is also preserved as long as action costs are positive. Um, and then, um, uh, so that's basically, you know, efficiency is no different, it turns out. In fact, to get an idea of efficiency, let's uh, look at a different graph. Okay, this is basically the wait and switch graph. Okay, I call it bait and switch graph because up front it makes you go this side, this side, this side, all the way here, right? Because these guys will be looking better and better compared to this guy. So you keep following this path, okay? And then finally you will find when 25, at some point of time you'll find that this whole thing is 25 plus 0.3, 25.3, and this is only 9, so you will still pick it and end. But efficiency-wise, you're wasting a lot of time. Now notice that this graph, I could have made it much more even by essentially making this part of this graph much bigger. Okay, so I bait you into coming into my subtree, and I'll just turn you around, round, 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 round. After you complete my subtree, you get out. Okay, and you will still be optimal, but you wasted a lot of time expanding all sorts of silly nodes which were not actually on the path to the optimal goal. Do, do, you, do you guys understand that? So that's why it's still a blind strategy because anything which only cares about how far have I walked and not about how far do I have to walk is going to be blind. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know, if you're looking only at the G cost, that's the sunken cost. And people always tell you in economics that you shouldn't keep bothering about sunken cost. You have to think about how much more are you going to get, how much more are you going to lose. As against how much have I lost already, how much have I gained already. You need both together, in essence. And blind strategies only care about how far have they come, not how far do they have to go. And so this thing looks good, 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 and then here it gets hit. 25. Now what's interesting is, as I said, I can make this to be a exponentially large tree. Exponentially large tree. Okay, and so I can make uh, you know uniform cost search to be very inefficient. No more inefficient than a blind search. So I'm just saying is it will still be optimal, but it can be quite inefficient. Okay. Um, now, however, it will still be optimal. You can actually do this by hand and find that eventually you will backtrack and go to this graph. So unlike the breadth first search where you don't think of the notion of backtracking, here essentially there is some notion of backtracking. It's essentially that instead of going on this path, you suddenly shift to this path and start expanding this path. Okay? Now, one more thing is what if the graph is undirected? Okay, even there, the properties hold. You know, the optimality holds, the completeness holds. Okay, it's just that it will take longer, long, even more and more expansions before it actually reaches the place. Right? So, for example, in this case, um, you started with A, B, C, D, G, right? Um, so, you will notice that you start with A first, then you get B as well as G. This is G value 1, this is G value 9. Uh, then when you expand B, you get C as well as A. Notice that I did not have to worry about A, B, A, B, A, B happening, which depth first search would do. I don't have to worry about it because going back to A through B cannot be better than not going anywhere from A. Why is that not a thing? Because the actions cannot be negative cost. They also cannot be zero cost. So this A has to be strictly worse than this A. That's what saves you in getting from getting into infinite loops, right? So you got a two here, g value two here. This is also a g value two. Uh, so you know, you know, you basically pick one of them and expand. 
In this case, you get uh, D and B again. This D has three, B has three. You pick one and expand, you get a G here, and you get a C here. Um, and then if you wind up picking this, basically you know, notice that at this point you have a five uh, G value. Um, no, we're not done here yet, actually. We won't be done here yet, because it actually would have picked C3. And it would do that further. But eventually, it will come back to this. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, actually, when, when I showed this picture, right now is not the time it stops. It will also expand C. OK, but one of the, one of the um, extremely, extremely annoying things about blind search is it won't pick the goal until it has proved to itself that every other path, every other path is worse than the path to the, the current, the best path to the goal. That's why, it, that's why it is helped in getting the optimality. You know, the answer that, the proof that we used here depended on the fact that it wouldn't have picked this path until even this partial path is already as bad as this. And that's why you could not get to a better way, better goal from this. That looks like a feature here because you're getting a desirable property, but it's also a huge bug in terms of efficiency. You know, uh, these kinds of searches will spend tons and tons and tons of time trying to make sure that every other path, every other path is dominated by the current path before you expand the current path. Okay? Yes. In this example, uh, when it expands C, the path will be A, B, C, D, C, G, B, G, right? Yeah, but it will still find this path. Yes, but the it is not the optimal path, right? Yeah, see, there may be inoptimal paths in the tree, but the one that you will stop with will be optimal path. Okay, so re the recorded path... So there path could will... be inoptimal paths in mm -hmm. the subtree that is explored. Okay. But the one that you end up will, will be optimal. Okay. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Now, of course, you could have improved this here by refusing to generate the ancestors by using the closed list strategy that we were talking about yesterday. In that full closed list, uh, remember the ancestors and don't go back to the ancestors. Okay, that way you could have improved the performance. But the proof itself that you will get an optimal solution when you say I'm done, that still holds watertight. Okay? So that's the advantage of, you know, sticking to the G value. Okay? Um, and as I said, even if there are cycles, you will all, even if you are not checking for the cycles, you will still get out of the cycles. Because every time you go around the cycle, you will increase the path of path cost a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And eventually, you will get out of the cycle. Okay? Um, in fact, uh, just to give you a feel for how uh, things work here, there is a paper that your TA, Will Cushing, has written uh, this year, essentially showing uh, that in many real world domains, um, there's a huge variance between the highest cost action in the domain and the lowest cost action in the domain. And whenever that happens, that means you have actions that can just take 0 0.001 cost. And then there are also actions that take 10 cost and 15 cost and so on. Whenever that happens, this kind of searches, these kinds of searches can be exponentially bad because they will do 0 0.001, 0 0.001 action many, 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 many times until eventually that path is worse than the optimal path and then get to the optimal path. Okay? And so he actually points that that's an issue. And, you know, of course, it, it should have been known, obviously, but, you know, I think people do forget these kinds of issues. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so uniform cost search is over. Again, here is the notation that's kind of worth remembering. Uh, C, N, and dash is cost of the edge between the two nodes, N and N dash. And G of N, on the other hand, is the cost of coming to that node from the root node. Okay? Um, and then normally distance is used as the shortest distance between two nodes. 
okay? Uh, okay, now what is depth per search doing? You know, we already proved that it is, it is complete and it's optimal. And another way of understanding what depth per search is doing, suppose let's say this is like a metric graph, you know, these are rows, have you know, distances and so on. Um, so in essence, it sort of can be seen as searching in ever increasing concentric circles around the start node. Okay, um, normal depth per search searches the concentric search circles. You know, radius increases by depth one again every time. Here, the radius increases only by the cost increment. And the cost increment between two things is only guaranteed to be non-zero. It could be 0 0.000001. Do you see what I'm saying? So you slowly increase your concentric circles until you find that there is a node exactly at that distance from your starting node. And that's a goal node. And since you haven't found goal up to here, then it must be the optimal goal. So that's another way of understanding why you know uh, breadth per search works, or why uniform cost search works. Okay. Um, this is the proof of optimality that I wrote down here. You can look at this one later. And again, as I said, the only thing that we care about is non-zero cost for the action, non-zero non and non-negative cost for the actions. Okay. So now we are actually going to start wondering about searches which not only care about how far they have traveled, but try to estimate how far they have left to travel. And if they have such an estimate, obviously the efficiency can be much better. The question of course is A, where do you get those estimates? And B, what properties should those estimates have so that the search will still be optimal? And that's the famous A star search. Okay, so you are like one slide away from a star search right now. Okay, um, so go back to the bait and switch graph. Okay, so you are, uh, you know, you are here right now, B is 0.1, G is 9. Now B is just saying, come on over, you know, I'm like really going to get you to the optimal goal. And G looks like a loser. Even though it's a goal, it looks like a loser because it's 9 cast. Right? Somehow, the reason is because you only traveled 0.1 distance to get here, you already traveled 9 distance to get here. And you think, well, I need to look at this more. But the real question is not how much you have traveled, but how much more you have to go to. The total that matters is the best path from here through this node to the goal node. And similarly, the best path from here through this node to the goal node. And of course, that would be just 9, because it's already a goal node. And this, we need to estimate. And to estimate this, you need to ask yourself, what's the best path from B to goal node? So if you look at this graph, what's the best path from B to the goal node? This. OK? So if you happen to know exactly what that best path is, that would be 25.2. And if you add the 25.2 here, and a zero here, because this guy is already at the goal, he doesn't have any more to travel, right? Then you pretty much clearly can see this is a loser, this is a winner, and you will go with this. If you know the exact cost of the best path through that node, okay, we will use a different notation for that. So you're starting from n0, so you got to some n, and we know the g of n is that cost, okay? And then we also know that we want to guess the distance from n to the goal node. Okay, what is the best distance from n to the goal node? I will call that h star of n. That's the perfect estimate of the shortest distance from that node to the goal node. Okay, 
Suppose I were to give you h star for every node, I also go ahead and give you the h star of n. Then instead of instead of prioritizing the q in terms of g of n, you want to really prioritize the q in terms of f of n, which is equal to g of n plus h star of n. What matters is how far, not what how far you have traveled, but how far do you still have to travel? So, so it's, it's a sum. It's not just one. You know, it's not enough to anybody who only cares about how far they have left to travel will go depth first. They don't remember how far they've already traveled. Anybody who only cares about how far they have traveled up until now will go breadth first. Anybody who has a good estimate of the total distance I'm likely to travel in this direction to get to the goal will do better than both of them. Right? The interesting thing, of course, is everybody knows how far they travel from the starting point. That's just, you know, you just have a little pedometer, you know. So if you're walking and, you know, you have a pedometer, it'll tell you how far you're traveling. That's just, it's there, you know. You don't need to look, I mean, it's already available to you. What you do need is this information. That's not as obvious. Now, suppose I were to give you a star. In this particular case, when I gave you a star, I'm just done. Basically, a star would already tell me, this guy is not as good as this guy, so I pick this guy, I'm done. What's even more interesting is, I could have had a humongous, exponentially large subgraph embedded around here. And I would still have completely given it a wide berth and gone to G. If I get you H star, the number of expansions you will do would be equal to D. Which means that D is the depth of the optimal goal node. That's the fewest expansions you'll ever do. And you will still get optimum. OK? Now, this is good, but what's wrong with this? Where do you get h star? To compute h star, here is a good idea. You know, So basically do the subgoaling. Now I need, for every node, I need the optimal path of that node from the goal node. So I will subgoal, call another uniform cost search whose goal is to find the optimal cost path from this to that. And use that as the h star. OK? If you do that, you clearly will do linear number of expansions in the, general, in the top level search. But then you're spending all your time plus more in your sub-goal searches. You see what I'm saying? Because you're still finding optimal path of this to this. In, uh, originally, all you needed to do is find an optimal path from this to goal. Now you will be finding probably exponential number of searches, optimal cost paths. OK? And so it's not, it, it is a, one of these silly ideas, like, um, you know, as, as I think uh, Archimedes, uh, uh, no, who invented the idea of fulcrum and lever, basically is said to have said, that, you know, I can lift the universe for you, okay? All you need is to give me is a big enough lever or a stick and a good place to put a fulcrum. And then I'll just, you know, push one side and then the universe will be lifted on the other side. It's true, but exactly where are you going to get that stick and where is the fulcrum going to be, okay? H star is a great idea, but computing H star is hard. Okay, so now notice that if I'm thinking of f of n, I can actually say that what I was doing in the previous slide is also f of n. Is that instead of I'm defining f of n to be g of n plus h0 of n, where h0 is uniformly defined to be 0 for everybody. Do you see what I'm saying? So in essence, you can actually say that um, uniform cost search is using heuristic value. This h is called the heuristic, and h star is called the perfect heuristic. 
And you can actually say that the uniform class search is using heuristic. It's just, it's using a sort of a dumb heuristic called h equal to zero always. The beauty of that heuristic is that it is very easy to compute. Because for every node, it's zero. Okay? However, the, and it, but the problem is it's overly optimistic. It's assuming that every way the left, the rem remaining work to be done in any of these paths is zero. Which is basically why it only goes with the G value. But here is the interesting thing. When it used H equal to zero, it was optimal. Do you see what I'm saying? When it used H equal to zero across the board, it was optimal. H equal to H star, it will not only be optimal, but will be efficient. So my question would be, if I were to start thinking about estimates on H star, H star is the perfect heuristic, and you can't compute that because it's too costly. Okay, suppose I'm trying to compute estimates on H star, so that hopefully the estimates are cheap to compute, but the estimate will not be obviously equal to H star. It's likely to be either less than H star or greater than H star. Or sometimes it's kind of all over the place. You know, for example, you know, if I have uh, if I have the nodes n like this, maybe H star is like this. Let's say this is H star. So these are the nodes, and for each node, what is the H star value? Okay, H zero is this. So it is approximating this curve by x-axis. Okay, now I can approximate this curve, let's say, by this. I can also approximate this curve by this. I can also approximate this curve by that. Okay, the question is which approximation will guarantee optimality for me? You can already see that this works, right? So if you are probably below H star, you seem to get optimality. So in fact, as long as you stay below H star, if you are guaranteed to always stay below H star, then you guaranteed to be optimal. Okay, so the idea is that I want H star, I don't have H star. H zero of N is always less than H star of N. I mean, is always less than or equal to H star of N. Okay, now any other H of N, which is also less than or equal to H star of N, would be fine. This is my intuition right now. I still prove it for you that this actually works. <coughs> okay, and what's more interesting is the reason I think Hn might be better than H0 is probably because H0 of n is less than or equal to H of n, which itself is less than or equal to H star of n. That means this is my perfect heuristic. Okay? And this is my H0 and something here, which is sort of in between both of them, is better than this. The best you can get is this curve itself, but that's too costly to compute. Okay, so the intuition that I just told you is basically saying, if you have for all n, h of n less than or equal to h star of n, where h of n is your estimate for the distance, your estimate for the distance, which hopefully is cheaper to compute than h star of n, then I am guaranteed that if I use this in my f of n, I'm guaranteed to be optimal. Okay? I will prove this again, you know, formally before we are done today. But that's basically the major intuition. Okay, now one question is, where do you get, I mean again, we'll spend like a whole class talking about where we get heuristics, where you get these kinds of estimates. Now you want estimates not, which are not only estimates, but they are optimistic estimates. If you think of 
h star as the true distance from where you are to the goal node as long as you estimate the if you as long as you do an optimistic estimate of the true distance you call it visible optimistic estimate means i don't have to travel as far i travel less the most optimistic estimate is i don't have to travel anymore i'm already there that's the that's what uniform cost search does right so if so where do i get optimistic estimates think of a search in this room okay i'm trying to find a path from me to one of these students okay right now the question then is um, the exact path depends on the obstacles you're putting random you know uh, chairs etc so i have to walk around the obstacles to get there can you tell me an optimistic estimate which i can easily compute straight line distance how do you know that straight line distance is always guaranteed to be optimal estimate why who, who, how did you know this did you take a bunch of points and compute whether or not the true distance is Uh, higher than or equal to the straight line distance how do you know that straight line distance is always going to be less than or equal to the true distance euclid proved it for you you understand what i'm saying euclid proved it for you this is the important thing admissibility of the heuristic cannot be just piecemeal said you know shown that notice that it's okay here notice that it's okay here you need to actually prove beforehand that this is an optimistic estimate and one way you get optimistic estimates is take the problem relax the constraints in the problem relax the constraints in the problem and solve it and the optimal solution in the relaxed problem is going to be less than or equal to optimal solution in the real problem so what i'm doing in terms of my straight line distance is i to go there to him i'm essentially assuming okay i'll assume there are nobody in this room other than me and him no 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 chairs no tables nothing in which case my optimal distance is just the straight line distance and that will be guaranteed to be less than or equal to the true distance when you start putting random obstacles as long as you don't put obstacles that allow you know tunneling through the space if you do tunneling through the space then you have put negative cast actions do you see what i'm saying okay so this is how heuristics work you you generate heuristics by acting as if the problem has fewer constraints than it actually has and solving that less constrained problem so it's almost as almost basically syntactically the same idea that i mentioned earlier when i was talking about h star which is when i am about at n i will try to find the distance by actually doing a sub search under n but in doing sub search under n i won't solve the original problem i'll solve the relaxed problem the more relaxed the problem the less informative the heuristic the less relax the problem the more informative the heuristic if you don't relax at all then you get perfect heuristic the reason you relax is because it will be otherwise the computing h star typically would not be cost effective okay so there is a huge interesting point which we will again talk about probably next class that there is this trade off between which heuristics are you going to compute originally people used to think that heuristic should be something that would should take milliseconds to compute but really that's not the issue what matters is the total time you spent on the search and some of the model heuristics do pretty complicated sub search which is not as hard as the full search and their total time is better than those which use h star as well as those that use cheap heuristic Okay, that's why it's a beautiful idea in terms of what is the right place 
What's the right level of relaxation that you should consider? Okay, so our classic example, since we're talking about this, is suppose I'm in New York. You know, it's not any longer this classroom, but I'm in New York, okay? And uh, I'm trying to find, go from where I am to where my friend is, and I'm trying to find the shortest path. Now, of course, real New York has whole bunches of cabs walking, going around, kids on the road, and you know, half the roads are closed, some roads have traffic jams, etc., etc. Okay, so I need to relax it. A highly optimistic relaxation is to assume that wherever I am, I can travel zero distance and I'll reach my friend. It's just an estimate. It's a particularly bad estimate, but it is still optimistic estimate. A next optimistic estimate is to assume that magically everybody just disappears from the, so in the first optimistic estimate, I'm assuming there is like a time tunnel that was created between me and my friend, so that I just go directly there, in instantaneously. The second optimistic estimate is, I assume that all the buildings and all the cars and all the roads just disappear. Then I'm in a plane. And the optimistic estimate of my distance then, in that relaxation, relax problem, my distance from my friend is the straight line distance. A slightly better relaxation than that, you know, whenever I say better relaxation, that means keep more of the real constraints in. Okay, better relaxation means keep more of the real constraints in. Now, have, how many of you have been to New York? Wow, okay, only two people have been to New York. Um, so, so in New York, it turns out essentially, in, in Manhattan, you know, the roads essentially are like grid. And there are very few roads, like Broadway, which are actually diagonal. Okay, so in Manhattan, typically, if you wind up traveling on the roads, it's like this. This is how your roads are. So if your friend is here, and you are here, you know, when in the original abstraction, where you assumed all the roads, everything disappeared, you thought you can go like that. Unless you are on one end of Broadway and your friend is on the other end of the Broadway, this is not ever going to be the distance you travel. The true distance will always be higher, but it will be even you know, more higher than you know, the straight line distance, obviously. But you can get a better estimate by realizing that I'm in Manhattan, and in Manhattan I have to travel like this. Or like that. Because it's a grid. This distance is, by the way, called what? Manhattan distance. It's actually a standard name. It's called Manhattan distance. In any, on any grid between two points, okay? So if this is x1, y1, this is x2, y2, the straight line distance is square root of x1 minus x2 whole square plus y1 minus y2 whole square. Manhattan distance would be what? Absolute value of x1 minus x2 plus absolute value of y1 minus y2. That's Manhattan distance. Okay? And you can be sure that this function dominates this function. It will never be lower than this function. Okay? And what is more, if you are in Manhattan, using Manhattan distance is a better relaxation than using straight line distance. Okay? And so the amount of expansions you will do with Manhattan distance will be much fewer than the amount of expansions you will do with the straight line distance. And both of them will be guaranteed to be optimal. And you know, it's not like this is somehow much harder to compute than this. Both these functions are essentially instantaneous to compute. So if you're in Manhattan and you use this, you, are, you may as well say I'm using zero. You know, you're better than zero, but you are not particularly smart. You should really be using a slightly less relaxed, a better relaxation. Okay? Now, the reason this is interesting as, as we are here, the reason this is interesting for you is that um, let me actually, since I talked about it so much, let me just 
go multiple slides uh, back and get to This is your first project, right? I told you that this is your first project. You're going to be doing eight puzzle problems. Okay, now here is my start state. Here is my end state, let's say. Okay, the H value is trying to compute the minimum number, it's trying to estimate the minimum number of moves you need to go from this configuration to this configuration. I will give you two heuristics. Heuristic one, H1S, is number of misplaced tiles. Number of misplaced tiles. Ignoring blank. Okay? So here, for example, five is in the wrong place, four is in the wrong place, six is in the wrong place, one is in the wrong place, eight is in the wrong place, seven is in the correct place, three is in the wrong place, two is in the wrong place. So after eight, Tiles, seven are in the wrong place. I can guarantee you that you can't get me a solution which is better than seven for going from here to here. Because ultimately each tile has to go to its right place. Each tile has to go to its right place. And so you are never going to do less work than the number of misplaced tiles. Okay, that's one simple idea, number seven. Okay, now, so H1S will be seven. And you know, that's way better than zero because if you're doing uniform cast search, you will assume everything is zero. And so you will do a lot more expansions with H1S. A lot more expansions with H0S compared to H1S. Now, one question I have here is why did I insist on only looking at the number of misplaced tiles? Why didn't I consider the blank? Here is blank. Here, the blank is here. So blank is also misplaced. Should I count blank? Can anybody think of why I shouldn't count blank? When you arrange all of those, blank will be in the back. Basically, imagine a situation, imagine a situation where my current state is exactly this state, except blank is here, two is here. Two is in the wrong spot, and so is blank. If you count two, then that will be as if I require two moves to get to the right configuration. But really, I only need one move. So I overestimate in that one scenario. And admissibility is for all n. H of n is less than or equal to H star of n. It's very strict on its requirement. It's not. It's not enough for you to say, oh, 99% of the time, I'm less than H star. Why don't you let me go? Then it will say, yes, maybe 99% of the time, you will be optimal. You figure out which 1% you are not optimal. And you are screwed. Because as I told you, if you say optimal, you know, maybe optimal is like the dumbest um, guarantee anybody can give. Maybe optimal is completely useless. Because then I have to do the entire problem myself to figure out whether or not you're optimal. Either you have to give optimal or not optimal. If you don't get right. So it's, and optimality is only guaranteed, the sufficient condition for optimality is admissibility. Admissibility is this, H of n is always less than H star of n. If you can find one state goal pair such that your heuristic computes the distance, which is pessimistic. That means it's actually higher than the true distance. You're dead. It's not admissible anymore. Not admissible doesn't mean that your search will never produce optimal solutions. It's that it may sometimes produce inoptimal solutions. And once it does that, you're dead. Because you don't know when it is optimal, when it's not optimal. Optimality is a global property. You can't just stare at the solution and say, are you optimal? Okay, so that's the reason why we make sure that we don't count the middle. We don't count the blank, we only count the tiles. 
Yes. If uh, one and two are uh, misplaced in the goal state, mm -hmm. and uh, and then also we require only one uh, more, right? I mean, there are many examples. I just need to give you one counter example to say that admissibility doesn't hold. I just need one counter example. There are many many places where this is inadmissible, but I just need to give you one. In fact, whenever you want to prove that something is inadmissible, it's some much simpler because you just need to give one counter example of to that particular statement. Okay, now, the second idea I have is to realize that actually eight puzzle is like Manhattan. Things cannot be moved diagonally. Things can only be moved vertically or horizontally. Right? Okay, so if I am two places away from my correct place, then I will need two moves to get to my correct place in terms of the Manhattan distance. Okay, so the Manhattan distance you say is not just going to count the number of misplaced tiles, but for each tile, it computes the Manhattan distance from its, between its current position and its right position, and adds them all up. Okay, and in this case, what happens? Five is here, it needs to be here, so one, Two, three, four moves to get to the right position. Okay? And similarly, four is here, it needs to be here, it needs one, two moves to get to the right position. So you add all of those numbers. Okay? And if you add those numbers, essentially you get 18. Once again, you only count the tiles, not the blank space. Now notice that 18 is hugely bigger than 7. 7 is hugely bigger than 0. So anybody who is doing search with h equal to 0 is much worse than anybody who is doing search with h equal to number of misplaced tiles. Who in turn is much worse than anybody who is doing search which is equal to number, I mean, is, is equal to sum of the Manhattan distances of all the misplaced tiles. Okay, now, um, let's, uh, let's forget about this. We'll come back to this later. Let me give you some inkling of how big a difference we are talking about in terms of these two heuristics. You know, you will do these two heuristics in your, in your project. Okay, it's not that hard to compute either of them. And you know, both, you know both of them are admissible. And you know, any time you have any time you have two heuristics, any time you have two heuristics, H1n and H2n, such that 0 less than or equal to H1n is less than or equal to H2n is less than or equal to H star n, for all n, then I would say, which is a better heuristic in this case? H2. H2. The closer you get to perfect heuristic, the better you are. If you become perfect heuristic, you are the best possible heuristic. Okay? And so I would say that this is more informed than H1. And the most informed heuristic is H star, because it knows exactly how much is the minimum distance to travel. And in the eight puzzle scenario, the Manhattan distance is more informed than the misplaced tiles heuristic. Right? And so you expect that more informed heuristic will do less search. And both will give you optimal solutions, but the more informed heuristic will give you less search. Again, just so remember, this H will be added to the g value for every node n, you would add g of n plus h1 of n for the guy who is using h1 as the heuristic, and g of n plus h2 of n for the guy who is using h2 as the heuristic. These are two different searches. And you use, these are all called, you know, this is f2 of n, this is called uh, F2 of n, F2 is the evaluation function, 
which is G plus H, okay? And this is F1 of N. And our, our intuition is that a search which does F1 of N as its prioritization metric to organize the queue is going to be doing worse than the one which uses F2 of N, as long as H2 is always greater than or equal to H1, while still being less than or equal to H star. If it winds up not being less than or equal to H star, then what happens? Then you no longer get optimal. To get that into your head, think of if all you want to reduce is search, all you want to reduce is search, and you know many case whether or not you got an optimal solution, there is a way to do that, which is assume that I have infinitely more work to do. So this is what you know kids do. Like, you know, I have infinitely more work to do. I don't feel like doing anything. If you have infinitely more work to do, why do anything? And obviously, if everybody has infinitely more work to do, then not, they're also not doing anything, and so you should get the same 4.0 GPA as the other kids. Right? So you, but you estimate it, a you know, finite amount of work as infinite amount of work. By doing that, you cut down the search. It will become zero. You don't need to do any work during search. But the problem, of course, is you don't get completeness or optimality. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So to, if you, all you wanted to do is reduce search, this H2 can be increased such that for every n, H2 of n is infinite. But then the problem then is it will not be less than the equal to H star of n. So H star of n is sort of the speed limit, you know, of uh, universal speed limit of this search strategy. You can never cross the perfect heuristic which itself is problem dependent. Perfect heuristic is with respect to the current problem, which it's not being relaxed at all. Okay, so anyway, so coming back to this particular uh, picture, right, uh, we will go over this later. Performance on eight puzzle, random 15 puzzle, in fact, I'm going to talk in 15 puzzles. Eight puzzle is too easy, actually. You guys do it because you're doing it for a puzzle, okay? 15 puzzle is kind of more worth doing, and 24 puzzle is at the, you know, at basically at the edge of what computers can do right now. Okay, so random 15 puzzle instances were solved optimally using IDA star, which I didn't mention. Basically, anybody who uses F value this way, it's called an A star search. And I'll talk about iterative deepening version of A star search either today or when we come back. But essentially, they can, be, they can solve 15 puzzle instances with IDA star search very easily. Um, optimal solution length for 15 puzzles are approximately 53 moves. On the average, optimal solution lengths are 53 moves. Okay? 400 million nodes at that time were being generated on average. Average solution time for these cases were about 15 sec 50 seconds. And uh, the Manhattan distance, um, however, while Manhattan distance is actually significantly better than misplaced tiles, I don't have the info numbers here. Uh, Manhattan is the only one that actually was giving those numbers. Um, but even Manhattan, if you take it to 24 puzzle, um, it will take 65,000 years. Um, you know, this was uh, some years back, and I think computers have speeded up by about 10, a factor of 10. So it's not going to be 65,000 years, it will only be 6,500 years now. Okay, uh, to solve optimal, uh, solve uh, 24 puzzles optimally, using Manhattan distance heuristic. There are even better heuristics. Okay? Now, the problem, since we are here, let me come back and talk about this, that the reason, as I said, the trick is to consider less of a relaxation. To get a better heuristic, you consider less relaxed problem. Misplaced style heuristic assumes all tiles just disappear and that you can move on the blank table you know, in any diagonal direction. Manhattan distance assumes that all tiles disappeared, but the roads are like this, as in Manhattan. So the second one is a better relaxation than the first one. But it's still, both of them are too much of a relaxation because you are moving through tiles. You don't care about tiles, you know. So you act as if when you are doing the Manhattan distance, you are actually counting the distances uh, that each puzzle has to travel as if each puzzle is independent, each tile has to travel as if each tile is independent of every other tile. 
But that's not true. Piles are connected. Right? Um, so to improve the relaxation, you need to consider some of the interactions between the tiles. Okay? To give you an idea, so for example, um, suppose this is current configuration of, uh, um, so, so suppose I assume that my goal configuration is always going to be land first, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Suppose that's my configuration. Okay, so then what I could do, and, and suppose I'm at a node where currently, um, you know, so, so to get the entire configuration right, would you agree that I have to get this part of the configuration right? So if my goal was to just get these right, and I couldn't care less as to what happened in the middle, the cost of solving that problem cannot be higher than, I mean, the, the, the cost of, you know, the number of moves required to get to that problem cannot be higher than the number of moves required to solve the entire problem. Do you agree? So this is a pattern that holds in the final goal. Okay, so I can ask, ask myself how much how many moves do I need to just establish this pattern? So I do a full search now, okay? Where basically since I need this pattern, I need to care about the actual places where three is, where seven is, where 14 is, where 13 is, 12 is, etc. But I don't need to know anybody else. They are obstacles for me, they are nameless obstacles. So I just basically have move over, move over, move over, and then just kind of go through them. I'm not going through them, but at least I don't care where they end up. So now, if I'm considering a problem where I do have, you know, white tiles here, and these are numbered tiles, and this is the blank. My goal is to get to a configuration where the pattern, this pattern holds. Notice that this is slightly different from the, eight puzzle, the 15 puzzle problem, but it's easier than the 15 puzzle problem. Because in the real 15 puzzle problem, you care about the identities of these guys. Now, if you compute this, if you actually do search for this, that search would be cheaper than the full 15 puzzle search, but it will be much costlier, much, much costlier than just counting the number of misplaced tiles or just counting the sum of the Manhattan districts. And notice that I need to, for every possible configuration of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these seven tiles, for every possible configuration of these seven tiles, I need to know what is the optimal number of moves to get here. And there are exponential number of those kinds of configurations. And for each of them, I need a database. Saying the database tells me if your configuration is this, to get to this pattern, here is the number. And such a database would be called a pattern database. And you would compute this pattern database up front. So you would spend a whole bunch of time computing the heuristic. But in return to that, you will be able to solve the 24 puzzle problem. The total amount of time taken for both the heuristics and the actual solution will take significantly less than 6,500 years. It will take under the order of days. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is something, um, so in this case, the, the mean distance to go from here to here is 19 moves. Um, the, this is just the Manhattan distance says 19 moves but you at least need 31 moves to actually get this pattern established. And 31 is a much bigger than 19, and it's still less than H star, so you are a better jurist. Okay? Uh, so these are the pattern database heuristics where basically it's a complete set of such positions with associated number of moves. And you computed this. You spent time computing this. You do upfront work so that you can solve the problem easily. Now normally when you do upfront work, the worry is what if you're spending so much time upfront that you know it's you could have done H star upfront 
right? For every configuration, you do it star, and then when people give you a problem, you just look up. The problem is that way computing it would be um, that way computing it would be um, uh, more than six thousand five hundred years. Whereas computing this can be done under in the order of days, and then once you have this database, you can solve the rest of the problem in the order of half days. Okay. Uh, uh, so, for example, a seven-tile pattern database for the 15 puzzle contains 519 million entries. So you spend a significant amount of time computing heuristic. But what matters is whether heuristic helps your overall search. And in this case, it does. That's what I'm telling you. Okay? Um, so we will you know, we will skip this, but... Um, yeah, I don't have, uh, so, so ultimately, uh, one picture that I normally draw, and this is the last thing I'll do and get to go home today, is for every search algorithm that uses heuristics, every search algorithm that uses heuristics, okay? Um, suppose this is search algorithm S1, and this is search algorithm S0, uh, which uses heuristic H0. That means H is always zero. And S1 may be misplaced times heuristic. S2 may be Manhattan heuristic, um, and then uh, this should be H0, H1, H2, this is H0, this is H star, and somewhere here is the pattern database heuristic, HPD. And as you go this side, the heuristics are considering less and less relaxed versions of the problem. As you go this side, they're considering more and more relaxed versions of the problem. Now I want to consider two casts. Cast one, in green, which is the cost for computing the heuristic. The total amount of time I spent just computing the heuristic. It'll be very low here, little higher here, little higher here, right? So I think it'll sort of be like that. This is a qualitative curve. It'll be sort of like that. This is the heuristic computation cost. Now, if you were here, then you would have got H star. If you do have H star, the total time you spend doing the search, now that you have the heuristic, just doing the search, now that you assume that the heuristic is already in the database. The heuristic that, that the time you spend would be very low here. In fact, if you have H star, you just do D expansions, you're done. And the time you spend will be exponential here because you're ignoring heuristics, so it'll be like this. This is the time for search. Time for search. And this is the time for computing a heuristic. The total time you spend is the sum of those two. Right? The time you spent thinking about the heuristic and the time you spent actually using the heuristic. So the sum function would sort of look like that. The million dollar question is, where is this? What is the right level of relaxation of the heuristic, such that at that level, you spend probably a large amount of time in the heuristic compared to this, this is spending more time for the heuristic. And yet, the total time is minimized. What's interesting is in science, in any science, your mental biases ultimately hurt you the most. In the beginning of A-star search, when I took this course, okay, we were told heuristics should, should mostly be here. They should be easy to compute. For it to be a heuristic, it should be easy to compute. But then, you know, you get what you pay for, right? If you get H equal to, Z, H equal to zero is the best heuristic. It, it doesn't need any thinking at all. Min this, you know, Man Manhattan distance and, and also the misplaced styles are also cheap. But they don't, while they are low, the search with them is still quite high. And what you're paying for is the total cost. And it took like much longer time, maybe around like 10 years back, people have started realizing. Um, so in fact, for example, the Culbertson paper that I mentioned was only 1996. This is the pattern database heuristic paper. This is around the time when people uh, finally realized, uh, finally realized 
that in fact there is this trade off and that sometimes you can spend pages describing the heuristic and you can spend non trivial amount of time computing the heuristic and nobody is going to be mad at you because all that matters is how much time did you spend in solving the problem where <coughs> you take that is both the heuristic cost heuristic computation cost plus the search cost now for the 24 puzzle the guys who compute h1 they get done on the heuristic side in like 2 minutes and then they spend 6500 years minus 2 minutes doing the search Okay, you, if you use a pattern database, you might spend three days to compute the heuristic. And then only do half a day more search. So three and a half days still beats 6,500 years. Okay, so it's this idea of getting relaxations of the problem that are still tractable. And figuring out where the, you know, the, where the, uh, the optimum occurs. And more interestingly, right now we know that it doesn't have to be cheap heuristics. You can spend time looking at the cost-based heuristics. So I'll stop here. <laughs>